नमस्कार प्रोफेसर जोनी जी आई एम वेरी हैप्पी टू बी बैक इन मुंबई यूनिवर्सिटी एंड स्पेशली योर डिपार्टमेंट इट्स द सेकंड टाइम दैट यू आर गिविंग मी द ऑनर ऑफ एड्रेसिंग द स्टूडेंट्स एंड फैकल्टी इन योर डिपार्टमेंट I must thank all of you friends uh, because it's a very wet afternoon today in Mumbai and I spoke to professor uh, and asked him whether we should uh, still keep the talk on or uh, postpone it to some other day and said no 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 we'll have it and the full house today is proof that uh, all of you are interested in this very important subject uh, one of the most uh, hope giving developments in global politics <clears throat> friends cuba has captured the imagination of uh, people in india especially progressive people in india including mumbai for uh, a long long time ever since fidel castro che guevara and a band of young revolutionaries overthrew a dictatorship a usa backed dictatorship in cuba we back in 1959 and established the first ever communist government in the american continent so 1959 to 2008 49 long years fidel castro was the president of cuba of course he because of advancing age and uh, ill health he then was succeeded by his uh, brother younger brother it was not a dynastic succession because raul castro who is now the president of uh, cuba was a great leader in his own right he was one of the leaders of the cuban revolution and since 2008 he has been leading cuba in a very interesting direction of <coughs> change with continuity I said that Cuba has captured the imagination of Indians one because of Fidel and the other figure that all of us know young people here you know Fidel may be now receding in the memory of young people but there is one more icon of uh, the Cuban revolution Che Guevara who is perhaps the most famous icon all over the world especially on the t-shirts that young people wear there are at least a few people in the audience here who belong to the generation that were inspired by the cuban revolution we have ashok datar here ashok uh, rajwade then uh, chaya ji cuz i came much later but uh, when i was in the i was studying in iit hawaii the cuban revolution made a big impression on me there is especially one sentence in uh, che guevara's book on socialism where he says that you cannot build a better society a just society by dreaming about the dollar all the time that is if money and earning more and more money is your dream then you cannot build a better society that's something that inspired me there was also another book that i read those days history will absolve me history will absolve me is the the famous 
inspiring speech delivered by Fidel Castro in a court courtroom. And I must say, friends, that history has indeed absolved Fidel Castro, even though he's no longer in power. When just two days ago, 20th July, when the United States and Cuba re-established diplomatic relations by opening their embassies in Havana and in Washington, D.C. It was proof that history has indeed absolved Fidel Castro and the revolution that he led. A lot of people in this, in this audience may not know what exactly happened in Cuba after the revolution. How was Cuba transformed from a dictatorship into, into a very different kind of experiment with all its ups and downs, about which I'll come a little later. People may not know much about either Fidel Castro or Che Guevara. So I would like to begin, friends, by paying my tribute, my personal tribute, to these two great revolutionaries. Fidel is still alive. And Che, as some of you perhaps know, you know, he was assassinated in a CIA conspiracy in 1967. Even though he's no longer with us, he continues to inspire a young generation who dream of a better world, a just world. So I would like to begin by playing two short videos as my tribute to these two revolutionaries. I told you, friends, that uh, Che was assassinated in 1967 in the jungles of Bolivia in a conspiracy hatched by the CIA. But uh, he was not the on only person targeted. There were so many assassination attempts on Fidel Castro himself. And Fidel Castro was the head of the state of Cuba. So many, in fact, that once Fidel joked that if there was a Olympic Games for surviving assassination attempts, then I would win the gold medal. So Fidel has survived, Cuba has survived, and we see how the wheel of history has changed in a manner that has vindicated essentially what Cuba was attempting to do. Cuba, friends, is so close to the United States, and also it remains so far. It is only 90 miles from Havana. The southern tip of Florida is only 90 miles, so close. Yet, for over 50 years, 54 years, in fact, the United States blockaded Cuba economically ensured that there would be no American company, any American agency doing any kind of business or economic activity with Cuba. The attempt was to throttle Cuba into sub submission. And the United States put pressure on all other countries around the world to do the same. Initially, they succeeded. You know, when Cuba had the revolution in 1959, almost all countries in Latin America, that is, South America, the Caribbean, Central America, they boycotted Cuba. And almost all countries in Europe, barring France and maybe one or two other countries, they joined the United States in breaking diplomatic relations with, with Cuba. Progressively, all these countries re-established relations with Cuba. All the lonely 
survivor in this, in this uh, boycott game or isolationist game was the United States. So when the United States finally realized its mis mistake and agreed to re-establish relations, President Obama confessed that our policy has failed. His senior ad administration officials, they admitted that in trying to isolate Cuba, the United States got isolated itself. And a good example of that is what actually happened, you know, when Raul Castro and President Obama shook hands in Panama City in March this year. I'm going to show one more video. And this is the beginning of my talk, the historic handshake between Raul Castro and Obama that has paved the way for a, for a new and hopefully better, brighter relationship between the United States and Cuba. A short video, please. And the president of Cuba, Raul Castro, the brother of Fidel Castro. Today at a summit in Panama, the presidents of these two countries will meet face to face. Morning, that historic handshake between President Obama and the President of Cuba, Raul Castro, the brother of Fidel Castro. Today at a summit in Panama, the presidents of these two countries will meet face to face for the first time since the height of the Cold War in ABC's Jim Avila is in Panama City covering it all. Jim. Good morning, Dan. It was the handshake the world thought it might never see. A Castro, Raul, not Fidel, shaking hands with an American president. Nothing substantive was said last night. It was just a hearty handshake. But today, the two presidents will sit down and talk about the new era of relations between Cuba and the U.S. Not since Dwight Eisenhower was president and before the Castros took over Cuba had the two leaders of these two once enemies done that. It's happening at the Summit of the Americas here in Panama, where Cuba is being allowed to participate for the first time since the meetings began in the early 90s. They're expected to talk about the reopening of embassies today in both capitals, the lifting of the embargo, and taking Cuba off the terror list. The State Department has recommended that Cuba be taken off that list, the decision now in the president's hand, and could be announced at any moment. All in all, an historic day for both countries. Paula? Historic handshake for sure, Jim. Thank you. Indeed happened in March this year. This was at uh, the Summit of the Americas. This was the seventh summit. And since the summit process began, the United States had been telling all the member countries in Latin America not to invite Cuba. And it succeeded in prevailing upon all the, all the countries in boycotting Cuba. For the first six summits, Cuba was not represented because Cuba is communist. Cuba allegedly was a sponsor of terrorism, all that. But the truth was different. And it was manifesting itself again and again in the close ties between Latin America and Cuba. So much so, friends, that uh, this time, all the Latin American countries, they said, they said to United States that if you insist on us boycotting Cuba, we will boycott you. We will have the US, you know, America summit with Cuba, and it is up to you whether you want to come or not. Look how history has changed. You know, all these countries were defying the diktat of the United States of America. And that is how the United States found that it is getting isolated in its own backyard. You know, after all, Central America, Latin America is part of the American continent. And it was losing friends. The United States was losing friends in Latin America, in Central America. And Cuba was winning friends. And this led to President Obama saying that he does not want to live in the past. He does not want America to remain a prisoner of the past. 
he said the cold war you know this was the united states wanted to boycott and isolate cuba as part of its cold war policy any country that had chosen the path of marxism or communism is enemy and should be isolated so president obama said in panama city the cold war has been over a long time i'm not interested in having battles that frankly started before i was born you know this is admission by the president of the united states of america <clears throat> to his credit raul castro he praised obama for his realism and he said obama is an honest man and i have written that uh, by bringing about this non violent transformation an end to enmity between two neighbors president obama has partially justified the nobel peace prize that he won in 2009 friends there are so many episodes in uh, the history of united states and cuba relations that at one point had created real scare in the international community some of you perhaps know do not know that the cold war was not so cold it was really getting hot and hot because of the strained relations which relationship between cuba and the united states there was a time when soon after the economic blockade began began the united states also began an arms embargo you know a naval a kind of a naval embargo of of cuba and cuba had to turn to the other superpower of those days the soviet union and the soviet union placed its missiles on the cuban soil in retaliation america threatened to bomb cuba with nuclear weapons the famous cuban missile crisis of 1962 that's the only time after hiroshima when the world came to the edge of an atomic war all that is now history and very happily so cuba withstood this pressure pressure from the united states pressure from other countries that were at one time supporting the united states how cuba is a small country a small island in the caribbean its population is less than that of mumbai only 12 million and it was standing up to this mighty superpower the united states how because of patriotism people who loved their freedom and who were determined to defend their freedom at all costs they could withstand it because of a leadership that was committed to defending the freedom and not just it was not just cuba's freedom that it was defending it was defending a principle a principle that in our world big countries rich countries militarily powerful countries have no right to impose their will on smaller countries and cuba was establishing this principle you know cuba has undergone so much suffering in the past 50 55 years for a long time they got the help from the soviet union but when the soviet union itself collapsed and the communist rule disintegrated or came to an end that help dried up cuba was left all alone and the situation was was precarious yet they survived you know you should understand friends why it took the united states so long 
the cold war in a way ended in 1990 when the soviet union collapsed and along with the soviet union the rest of the communist governments in eastern europe so the cold war came to an end so if it wanted the united states could have established re established diplomatic relations with cuba then why did it wait lo wait so long they waited because they hoped that with the with soviet support coming to an end and with economic embargo of the united united states still intact the government the rulers in in america believed that this would force the people of cuba to revolt against their own government and after overthrowing fidel castro his government they would demand a government friendly to the united states but again for now 25 years close to 25 years this government survived how why again because the people preferred to live in poverty preferred to accept hardships economic hardships but not give up and not give in to pressure ultimately it is the united states that had to change its policy i would like to give you an example of uh, the extent to which the united states went to humiliate cuba you know in 1960 just one year after the revolution fidel castro had become the president of cuba and that was the height of the cold war he went to new york to attend the session of the united nations general assembly all of us know that uh, the united nations is headquartered in new york and all member countries have a right to go to new york because that is the convention of the united nations but the united states ensured that fidel castro was not given accommodation in any hotel in new york because he is a communist so fidel castro this young revolutionary said if this is what you do then i am going to put up a tent outside the united nations headquarters so this would have been a big embarrassment to the united states so ultimately they made sure that some you know some hotel in a very poor locality in harlem they gave accommodation to fidel castro and his delegation and you know to it goes to the credit of india that our then prime minister pandit jawaharlal nehru who had gone to new york to attend the united nations general assembly session in a show of solidarity he along with other leaders of the non aligned movement they went to that hotel and met fidel castro and said that we are with you so this is this is the strength of solidarity this is how people of cuba and the leaders of cuba one friends around the world i would not like to give an impression friends that uh, all was well or for that matter all is well in cuba many mistakes were committed by the communist government by the leadership the kind of mistakes or rather far worse mistakes that led to the disintegration of the soviet union and the collapse of the soviet union in fact 
the closed economy, the government controlled economy, it, it strangulated the progress of Cuba. The government control at one point was so strong that almost there was no private enterprise at all allowed. Even barbers were government employees. Can you imagine? So because of this, the size of the government, the number of employees employed by the government, directly employed by the government, became so huge, it became unsustainable for the government to, to run. So all these mistakes were also committed. And the new government of Raul Castro has been trying to undo some of these mistakes. You know, there is a very uh, telling comment made by Raul Castro after he took over that uh, we should forever erase the impression around the world that Cuba is the only country where people can have all the social security without doing any work. Hmm? Meaning thereby that when there is total job security by the government, work culture suffers. And we are seeing it in our own country to some extent. So he began economic reforms by one, re reducing fairly drastically the number of people directly employed by the government so that the government could save the money and use it for other development purposes. So Raul Castro also started encouraging private enterprise, cooperatives, and in a very limited way, even foreign investment. All this is certainly beginning to help Cuba. And after the normalization of relations between Cuba and America, now the prospects of uh, Cuba's development have become much brighter. Because as I said, America is very close. And once the relations get normalized, once direct flights begin between Cuba and America, there's going to be so much of tourism. Tourism is going to be flourishing. Cuba is a, is a wonderful place for tourists. Fabulous beaches, so clean. So it is going to be the next great tourism destination for people around the world. In addition to that, many other economic activities would get encouragement. So all this is going to see Cuba progress and become more prosperous, there's no doubt. Friends, the question is, and this is what uh, a lot of sympathizers of Cuba around the world, including in India, the question that all of us have in, on their minds is, will Cuba get Americanized. You know, Cuba, first with Fidel Castro and later Raul Castro, they have defended their freedom. They have continued to go along the path they had chosen. But now, Raul Castro himself is 84. And he has said that he's going to retire in, in three years' time, four years' time. He may retire even earlier. And when economy gets opened up, when political freedoms are given to the people, the question is whether Cuba will remain the same, or will Cuba, as I said, get more and more Americanized? There is al always the attraction of America, which is so close. In fact, a lot of Cuban people who were not sympathetic to the socialist cause, who were unhappy with uh, 
Fidel Castro, for whatever, whatever reason, they used to migrate to the United States. And the United States used to encourage this kind of migration because it would create unrest against the Cuban regime. As a result, you know, there are nearly 2 million people out of a population of 1.2 million. Now is the population 1.2 million, but there are 2 million Cubans living in America who migrated either legally, illegally. And there is obviously a strong pressure now that these Cubans in America, they want better relations between America and Cuba, and they exerted their own pressure on the American government to change the policy. So this diaspora is also going to help, just as the Indian diaspora is helping economic development of India, the Cuban diaspora in the United States will be a source of economic assistance, investment to Cuba. Again, in doing all this, whether Cuba will, will safeguard some of its unique achievements. Friends, you know, I must point out here that Cuba remained poor, but in spite of its poverty, it made some spectacular achievements, especially in social development. And I would like to, I would like to mention some of these. And I'm sure that uh, these, will, uh, these will surprise you. You know, for a small country like Cuba, when the Cuban Revolution took place in 1959, all the rich doctors, they fled to America because they, did not, they said that we do not want to work and we do not want to live in a system that is going to bring in egalitarianism. So out of 6,000 doctors in 1959, as many as 3,000 Cuban doctors, they, they left for the United States. So there was a real crisis. But do you know this, this government, Fidel Castro's government, said nothing doing, we will build a new force. And they gave highest priority to two things, education, health care. In Cuba, even today, and for the past 54 years, education is free at all levels for everyone, from the lowest, from the first standard to university, education is free for all. And similarly, health care is free for all. From the basic health care to the most specialized health care, it is free for all. Because they said that a government has a moral duty to take care of the health of our population and the education of our population. Because of this high priority given to health care, they have made amazing, amazing progress. The average, you know, the health status or longevity Lifespan of Cubans was 41 years in 1959. It is now above 75 years. So people are living longer and healthier. They have given a priority not only to improving the health status of their own people, but they are training health workers, doctors, paramedics, to help poor people, poor countries around the world. Something that no country around the world has done. And let me give you a few, few statistics. Today, Cuba has sent as many as 60,000 you know, doctors. I mentioned to you that they had only 6,000 doctors in 1959, of which 3,000 went away to the United States. Today, it has sent 60,000 Cuban doctors to serve people in 103 countries. Because Fidel Castro and his colleagues, they believed that we have a responsibility 
not only to our own people, but we have a responsibility to help people in need wherever. So this internationalist spirit, in spite of poverty, is, is simply unequaled. It is matchless. So 60,000 doctors working in 103 countries. You know, I had gone to meet the Cuban uh, ambassador for getting my visa to go to Cuba. I met him, but the second time I went to him, his office said that he is not here. He's gone to Nepal. Why? After the earthquake in Nepal, Cuba sent hundreds of doctors to help the people in Nepal. And the ambassador went himself. He stationed himself for several weeks to work with the medical team that had come from Cuba. All of us know that the largest country in Latin America is Brazil. It's also the most resource-rich country in, in Latin America. Brazil, right? One of the members of BRICS group. But when the new president came, you know, Mrs. Uh, Dilma Rousseff, when she became president, she said that we are a very rich country in some ways, but uh, a lot of our population in rural areas, in the, in the forests of Amazon, in far off areas that are highly underserved, we have no doctors, and our doctors don't go to the, these places to serve our own people. So she approached the Cuban government and said, can you help us? The Cuban government, headed by Raul Castro, sent 11,000 Cuban doctors to Brazil to help Brazilian people. And this made such a, such a big difference, friends, that when two years ago, Dilma Rousseff, she contested for re-election, she got re-elected, one of the major factors was that people were now happy in all those areas. People were happy because of improved health services. So our, our ambassador in Havana, C. Raj Shekhar, I was in Havana for five days last month, and I'm going to come to my, you know, my impressions, my personal impressions of Cuba a little later. You know what our ambassador, Raj Shekhar, said to me? He gave this information to me, and he said, Cuban doctors, 11,000 Cuban doctors going to Brazil, serving the people in the jungles, in far-off areas, and helping the president get reelected, it was like an ant giving blood to an elephant. Hmm? Cuba is an ant in front of Brazil. But it was Cuba that donated blood to Brazil. That is a spirit of internationalism. Another example, you know, two years ago, there was an Ebola epidemic in Central America, in Central Africa, a deadly disease. You know, one American doctor went there, risking his own life. And when he came back, it became big news. Hmm? One American doctor, you know how many Doctors Cuba sent to countries in Central Africa affected by Ebola and practically isolated by the rest of the world. Cuba sent 500 doctors. The largest number of doctors that went to countries hit by Ebola were from Cuba. So as a result, you know, many organizations have made a proposal to the Nobel Peace Prize Committee, Nobel Committee, that the Cuban doctors should be given Nobel Peace Prize, and they might yet get it. Healthcare research, 
is so advanced in Cuba that on July 29, just last, last month, the World Health Organization announced that Cuba is the first country in the world to eliminate mother-to-child HIV transmission. The first country in the world to eliminate mother-to-child HIV transmission. And Dr. Margaret Chan, the Director General of WHO, she said, eliminating transmission of a virus is one of the greatest public health achievements possible. This is a major victory in our long fight against HIV and sexually transmitted infections, and an important step towards having an AIDS-free generation. Let me give an example from sports. I, I told you, friends, that in spite of its poverty, they gave the highest priority to health care, to education, to fitness, and of course to sports. This small country, before 1959, it had won only 13 medals in Olympic Games, four gold medals. Only 13 before 1959 and four gold medals. After 1959 and till the last Olympic Games, Cuba has won 221 go, you know, medals in Olympics. 221, of which 67 are gold medals. India, just for comparison, our tally so far is 26 medals and only nine gold medals. How did, it, how did it become possible? It became possible because if a nation knows its priorities, that human resources are the most important resources to be enriched, and they can only be enriched by taking care of their health, by taking care of their education, by taking care of their fitness, so this is Cuba's achievement. You know, Cuba is among the first 10 countries with the lowest maternal, you know, infant mortality in the, in the world. Infant mortality in, in Cuba is 4.1. 4.1. India is 45. The healthcare system in poor Cuba is much better than in rich America. You know, all of you know that health care in America is a, is a big political issue. They just can't figure out how to take care of the health of their, of their people. Obamacare and this care and that care, they find that it's becoming increasingly unaffordable for even a majority of Americans themselves. So the Cuban health care model is a model for countries like India and other developing countries. How, in spite of poverty, we can take care of the health of our people, which is the most basic need. So these are the achievements of Cuba. And the question is whether in the post-Castro era, which is going to come sooner or later, whether these achievements will be safeguarded. I am quite hopeful that there will be changes. There will al always be ups and downs. History never moves in a straight direction. Yet, the people of Cuba will go ahead. And it should be our endeavor, friends, to wish them well. You know, Cuba is so far away. But as I said earlier, even when it was so far away, the people in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s generation, they know that Cuba, it captured the imagination of millions of people in India. People who valued human dignity, who valued freedom, 
who valued, who valued justice. Cuba may have receded from our national consciousness, but I would like to urge young students here to learn from the lessons of history. We should learn from the mistakes they committed, but even more, we should learn from the achievements of a country like Cuba, which are so relevant for India. I would like to end my, my talk by just telling you about my visit to Cuba last month. 4th to 9th of June, I was in Cuba. It was my dream come true because I had been, uh, I had been dreaming of going to Cuba ever since my student days. And this time, I got an opportunity because my wife and I went to attend the graduation ceremony of my daughter, who is here, Tapas. And we said that we must go to Cuba this time. And even today, there are no direct flights from United States to Cuba, even though they are so close. And this is because of sanctions. And the sanctions are yet to be lifted. Of course, they'll be lifted soon. No direct flights. So we went to Mexico. Then from Mexico, came to Cuba. And five wonderful days, days of education. And I have a few snapshots of, uh, of my visit. And I would like to show them to you. India relations have been very warm. I mentioned to you Nehruji's uh, solidarity with Cuba in the 1960s. This is Nehruji with Fidel Castro, Nehruji with uh, Che Guevara. When Che Guevara visited India, a farmer garlanding him. This is 1920, 1983, the famous NAM summit, non-aligned non movement summit that took place in New Delhi, hosted by Indira Gandhi, our former Prime Minister. Now, this is an interesting story. This, friends, is the building that has now become the American Embassy in Havana. It was an American Embassy before 1959, and it has once again become the Embassy. And during this period, it was called the U.S. Interest Section. Not an Embassy, but just a U.S. Interest Section. And U.S. Interests were being taken care of by Switzerland, the Swiss Embassy. So this was closed. Now, there is a story here. This is the statue of Jose Marti, the great revolutionary, Latin American revolutionary who is, uh, uh, who is uh, highly respected by people all over Latin America, including Cuba. He is holding a baby in his hand. I mentioned to you that the United States used to encourage people to migrate from Cuba to the United States in order to create disaffection against the Fidel Castro regime. So in year 2000, a boat <coughs> carrying people from Cuba was going to the United States. And several people, you know, the boat capsized and several people died, including the mother of this little boy, Elaine. Somehow, Eileen and a few others managed to reach the, the, the shore of Florida. They survived. The United States refused to hand over this child to the father who had stayed behind in Cuba. And the father said that mother is no longer there and I want the custody of my child. The United States didn't give. So Fidel Castro made this a big international issue. So in front of the, the former U.S. Embassy, he created a big protest area. And he installed, he got a, a statue installed 
of Jose Marti, the father of the nation, holding this little child and saying, accusing, you, you see the, the finger pointing towards America, saying that here is America that has kidnapped a Cuban child. And this became a big event. And all the, you know, every evening there used to be protests. The slogan here says, Patria o Muerte, means homeland or death. So this is the way in which they, they arouse the patriotic fervor. And ultimately, of course, the United States sent the child back to Cuba. Now, this is our ambassador, Raj Shekhar, and he hosted a dinner in, in my honor with my wife, daughter, and for this he invited the U.S. representative. The U.S. did not have an ambassador, but the U.S. still had a, a skeletal staff with the head of his interest section. So that is him and he is most likely to be America's new ambassador. This is me in front of uh, my idol, Che Guevara, in the Revolution Square in Havana. This, friends, is a, is a remarkable journalist his name is Mark Frank. He is the correspondent of Reuters in Havana. He's been staying there for more than 25, 35 years now. He's an American who chose to go to Cuba and live there. And he has now made Cuba his own adopted nation. He has written a wonderful book. It's called Cuban Revelations. I met him in Havana. And he said some very insightful things. You know, he was explaining to me both the pluses and minuses of Cuba. The minuses is that it became such a closed country. It created a lot of disillusionment among Cubans, you know, many Cuban people. Not that they were willing to revolt against Fidel Castro the way people revolted against Arab regimes in, in many countries like Egypt. But nevertheless, there was a lot of dis, dis, dissatisfaction. And that is because they felt that Fidel Castro was giving too much attention to solving the problems of the world and neglecting the problems of his own country. So he said that Fidel Castro was trying to fix the world and Raul Castro is now beginning to fix Cuba. But I must say that he also paid a very rich compliment to Fidel Castro. He said that the greatest achievement of Fidel is that he saved the Cuban revolution and Cuba from being overturned by the United States. And he gave the example, you know, a mother, when she knows that her child is drowning, then she'll do everything possible, including giving up her own life to save the child. What Fidel did is that in these 49 years, when he was at the helm, there were many times when the revolution, the child that he had he had created, he of course along with others, this child was drowning many times and Fidel, he motivated the people of Cuba, he inspired them to rush to saving that child, the child called revolution. That is his achievement and you, you must have seen, you know, in the first video that I showed you, you know, he was a Fidel, in his young days, was a mesmerizing orator, was a great leader, great inspirer. And that is how, with the collective will and determination of the people of Cuba, they could save the revolution against 
attempts, you know, in the face of attempts by the United States. Yeah, this is, uh, I'm in front of the Indian Embassy in Havana and uh, one of my engagements in Havana was uh, to speak at uh, the Havana Book Club. I spoke about my book on Mahatma Gandhi. You know, Cuba, I mentioned to you that they gave a high priority to health care, to education, to sports, but they also paid a high priority to reading to producing literature. So Cuba is a great book reading nation. You know, Cuban Havana Book Fair, a small country of 1.2 million people, but the Havana Book Fair that took place last year with India as one of the partner countries, you know, it attracted 2 million people. 2 million people attending a book fair. This is a polyclinic in Cuba for every 30,000 population anywhere in the country in, in villages or in towns every 30,000 population has a polyclinic. All the basic health issues are addressed by the polyclinic. This is uh, you know, we went to a unique medical college and research institute in Havana. It's called the Latin American School of Medicine. And there is a, these are Fidel and Raul Castro and the, their slogan says, health for the entire humanity. And there's a story behind this, this institute, friends, in 1999, there was a terrible cyclone that hit many countries in Latin America. You know, it big havoc, huge destruction. Very prestigious. This is street art in Havana. Again, street art. This is old Havana, friends. You know, old Havana is so charming and also so saddening because of poverty. People do not have money to keep their houses and buildings in good shape. So it's crumbling. At the same time, in recent years, an attempt has begun to restore these old buildings to their original glory and beauty. It's, uh, it's one of these places that uh, I found a bar which was, you know, which is a, it's bound to become a major tourist destination. It's called the Ernest Hemingway Bar. Hmm? You know, Hemingway, the Nobel Prize winning author, Cuba was very dear to him, so he made Cuba his home. In fact, the book for which he got the Nobel Prize, The Old Man and the Sea, it was written in Cuba. And he was a great supporter of Fidel Castro.
I told you that uh, the beaches in Cuba are fabulous. So, at this, the most famous beach, Varadero, uh, we, we found these four young Cuban boys having fun and doing all kinds of acrobatics for, for, for my pleasure. But I would like to point out one interesting thing, friends. You know, a black and a white. Cuba has a mixed population, whites and blacks. And the race relations in Cuba are far, far harmonious than in the United States. We know that the United States has not been able to overcome the race problem, discrimination against blacks. But in Cuba, there has been never a riot or any kind of violence on racial matters. This again is a big achievement. A street snapshot. You know, the, the picture is uh, rather blurred. But here is a young man and the t-shirt he is wearing it says, Go USA. It's a US flag, Go USA. And there are lots of young people, you know, who, who want to go to the United States of America because it's so close. And many of them have their relatives in the United States of America. And with the normalization of relations now, their dreams will come true. So this is a street football team, a Cuban Messi, And lastly, the fabulous suns sunrises and sunsets in Havana, the place where we were staying, you know, we could see both the sunrise and the sunset. It's a, it's a long eight kilometer promenade in Havana, one of the most beautiful places in the world. So we hope that uh, with the, with the positive turn that has come about, Cuba will progress further and India-Cuba relations will get more stronger in all different ways and many of you will have a chance to visit Cuba. Thank you very much.